Thank you very much, Liz. So, as Liz uh, mentioned, well, hey everyone, my name is uh, Maxim Vizeno, and today I have the uh, immense pleasure to be alongside the one and only uh, Hemos Mala here. And uh, we decided to uh, stand uh, in front of you today to talk to you about our experience with Cilium uh, over the past few years. And we have a lot of content for today, so I'm not sure we'll have time for questions, uh, well, time to answer the questions from the stage, but feel free to reach out to us uh, uh, next to it or on the uh, Slack community channel, you can see uh, our uh, handles uh, over this slide. So Emos and I both are engineers working for a company called Datadog. And uh, over there, what we do is that we operate Cilium uh, uh, on, a daily, on a daily basis. And uh, in case you don't know about Datadog, we are a SaaS uh, observability uh, uh, company with a, a platform, sorry, with about 5,000 employees uh, amongst the globe. Our infrastructure is solely cloud-based, and uh, the reason behind, and we are spread amongst several uh, cloud providers. The reason behind it is really driven by our business. Our customers want us to be uh, serving them from wherever they operate themselves. And as you can see uh, here as well, what we attempted to uh, reflect is that most of our workloads are scheduled onto uh, Kubernetes clusters. Uh, as you can see at Datadog, we share a common interest into Hexagon with the uh, eBPFBs. And uh, in terms of uh, numbers, we have several hundreds of Kubernetes clusters, over tens of thousands of nodes, and we are running uh, several hundreds of thousands of pods. And without too much surprise, I guess, if we're here today, we choose Cilium in order to implement our pod networking uh, network. Well, pod networking implementation. Uh, we did not use all of the features that Cilium has to offer, though. Uh, first and foremost, when we started looking into it, uh, our primary goal was to solve the IP address management and container network interfacing uh, needs that we had. Uh, we went straight away with the native routing implementation as we uh, evaluated the overlay uh, one, and it wasn't really fitting our requirements well. And secondly, what we wanted to do is to benefit from the QProxyless approach to uh, load balance our uh, uh, cluster IP-based services, and uh, also being able to see all the eBPF-related perks we would get uh, along the way. Uh, and then, for, from a security perspective as well, we were also very interested into the uh, implementation that Cilium does for network policies. Time-wise, as you can see here, our journey with Kubernetes started around five years ago. Um, when we started, we didn't go straight with Cilium. We uh, evaluated the, uh, 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 the respective uh, cloud service providers offering, but we quickly realized that this would not uh, go very far uh, with uh, our uh, upcoming needs. So we shifted uh, about a year into it uh, with Cilium, and uh, a year after we started implementing policies, and it's been about two years now that we are uh, that we have decommissioned our last remaining uh, non-Cilium operated cluster. So about today then. So getting started with Cilium is amazingly simple. We've seen that uh, over the past uh, few uh, presentations. You are only uh, a one-liner away from getting the networks packet flowing for uh, your pods. But on day two, though, uh, whether your goal is to keep the light on or to expand your estate, there are many knobs, many settings, parameters that can be tuned in order to keep those packets flowing. So which is why today, Emerson and I wanted to really retrospect and reflect over the various ones that we found uh, towards our journey. And please bear in mind that everything that we are going to tell you are uh, really um, in the light of the needs that we had, the challenges, the experience that, we, uh, that we've had over the years, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it will or does apply to you. You have your own setup, you have your own requirements. And so we really uh, are going to focus on the knobs themselves and not necessarily the values we've, uh, we've uh, set them to. And also, like most of the challenges that we are going to represent are really there to highlight like, how efficient and how uh, much of a synergy we can have with the Cilium community in order to overcome uh, these issues. And most of them are uh, sorted. Uh, and to start this up then, I will let Emos uh, guide you through uh, like what we could discover around uh, IPAM. Thanks, Maxime. So, as Maxime mentioned, at Datadog, we use Cilium for IP address management. For those of you who already run Cilium, this might be very familiar to you, but as a quick overview of how that architecture looks like, so Cilium primarily has two components, right? So we have the Cilium agent, which runs as a daemon set in your Kubernetes cluster and runs on every single node in your cluster, and it's responsible for doing things like installing BPF programs, allocating IP addresses to your pods, and things like that. 
And there's another component called Cilium Operator, which runs as a deployment in your cluster, and is the only component that is allowed to talk to your cloud provider APIs and do operations like create network interfaces or allocate IP addresses to those interfaces. And the Cilium Operator and Cilium Agent talk to each other through a CRD called Cilium Node. So one of the first challenges we ran into, um, oh, so one of the things we really like about the operator model is it allows us to standardize a lot of things across cloud providers. We can do things like centralized rate limiting compared to using um, cloud provider CNI models. So we can centralize all the rate limiting in the Cilium operator itself, and it also allows us to have uh, improved observability. And it also allows you to use common abstractions like pre-allocate, min-allocate, and max-allocate to maintain a certain pool of IPs available on every single node. So one of the challenges we ran into initially was how do we trade off between IP wastage and allocation speed? So as Maxi mentioned, we run a flat network model. That means we have a tight IP address space. So we cannot afford to really waste any IPs on any of our nodes. So we run all of our nodes with pre-allocate set to one, but the trade-off here is that if you have nodes, if you have a node where there is more than one pod scheduled on it, the IP allocation latencies go up. So one example is, imagine a node that has, let's say, 30 pods scheduled on it, and the node has to be replaced because there is a cloud provider window or something like that, cloud provider replacement window or something like that. And in this case, the operator would take a long time to allocate all the 30 IPs. So we introduced a feature called surge allocate, and with surge allocate, what the operator does is the operator maintains, or the operator is aware of all the pending backlog that's available on the node, and it will go ahead and allocate all the necessary IPs in one go. So this improved the allocation speed by a lot, and uh, this has been available from Cilium 111. And the next challenge we ran into was network address unit limitations in VPCs in Amazon. So. In Amazon VPCs, the default limit of no total network address units is 64K. You can request Amazon to bump that to 256K, but you cannot go beyond that. So in order to solve for that, Amazon introduced a new feature called prefix delegation. Using prefix delegation, instead of allocating slash 32 IP addresses on your ENIs, you can go ahead and allocate slash 28 prefixes. So this effectively allows you to allocate 16 times more IPs on every single interface, depending on the uh, instance you're running on. And not only on your instances, this allows you to have more pod density in your VPCs as well. And at this point in time, Cilium did not have support for it. Uh, so we worked with the community, and it's been available from uh, version 1.10. And I'll let Maxime talk about how we manage deployments. Thank you, Amos. So as I mentioned earlier, one of the greatest thing about Cilium is that it's super easy to get started, and its deployment process is really something that is taken seriously by the community. You have various ways to deploy it, whether you use the Cilium CLI, as uh, it has been shown, I think, earlier, or you leverage the Helm chart. And whether you're looking to deploy it for the first time or upgrading a large production clusters, there is tons of documentations at your disposal in order to pre to pre and mechanisms as well, sorry, in order to prevent you from breaking everything up when you do so. So, once again, uh, the aviation industry has a ton of interesting procedures uh, for us to inspire uh, ourselves, and uh, which is why, as pilot do before takeoff, uh, the first thing we do, uh, we choose to do before deploying Cilium, is to run the pre-flight checks. So the pre-flight check mostly consists, uh, for those who are not aware of, of a, a set of subcommands uh, of the Cilium CLI, which can perform various verifications before you attempt upgrading Cilium on your clusters. So it doesn't really matter on the initial deployment, although as you are upgrading uh, sensitive production clusters, this can uh, be helpful. So, so there is one test in particular that we are very fond of, which is the validate CNP1. And basically what, it's, what this test does is that it looks at all the Cilium network policies that are present on your cluster. It's going to iterate over them and ensure that the version of Cilium you are attempting to upgrade onto uh, is not going to be misbehaving with the uh, current state of these uh, policies. And or in our case, it was particularly useful when we attempted to upgrade from uh, Cilium 1.8 uh, to 1.10, I think, as we had many surprises that got highlighted through uh, this test. So all these CNPs that were configured on uh, our clusters were not actually pro providing us with the permissions we believe they were. And uh, the, re the main reason is that prior to Cilium 1.10, it was a very limited uh, set of uh, 
uh, validation being made over the uh, uh, Cilium Network Policies uh, syntax. And this led us to have like hundreds of uh, broken policies amongst our fleet. So first, what we discovered is that we had multiple indentation mistakes. And uh, basically, all those policies were still being accepted by the Cilium agent, although not being interpreted uh, correct. Well, they were interpreted correctly, although they were not really matching anything. A second thing that we discovered is that some users were, um, uh, well, uh, were misusing uh, the keys that were necessary for them to uh, really target some particular entities, some particular endpoints, and same results there, the policies didn't have any uh, effect uh, at all. So this got caught by the uh, validate CNP ones, although this is not a silver bullet, like there are some things that uh, do not get caught, and this is not really a bug, but a feature. Uh, like for instance, uh, in our case, we had, so, we had some users which were uh, leveraging uh, features of the Cilium network policy spec that were not yet implemented in Cilium 1.8, such as uh, this example here, ingress deny. And what happened then is that whenever we started rolling out Cilium 1.10, the agent uh, in their upgraded version interpreted that correctly, and we started dropping pa uh, packets uh, for those users. So how do we use this? So as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, there are various ways to deploy Cilium. Or cells we choose to leverage the hand charts as well. And uh, that way, yeah, we don't have to worry too much about all the glue that is necessary uh, to uh, deploy and roll uh, everything out. So enabling the pre-flight check is very simple. It's basically a, a setting, a variable that you can set uh, to true, and uh, you're pretty much good to go. But although, as I mentioned earlier, this is not a silver bullet. And secondly, we operate over hundreds of clusters. So just uh, sticking to those two things would probably lead us to easily break everything up and uh, we would, uh, if, we do not, if we did not look uh, any further. So this is where connectivity test comes to play. So as for the pre-flight checks, the connectivity test is also a set of subcommands that is available from the Cilium CLI. And what it does, is what, what, yeah. what this feature does is that it can actually spin up some test pods that can simulate uh, connection scenario, well, yeah, connectivity scenarios that you want to assess, whether pod A can talk to pod B, pod A can talk to uh, a cluster IP service or uh, an external uh, IP address. And in our case, what we decided to do is to leverage uh, the Helm rollout process and include those tests as part of uh, our Helm uh, charts definition. So we leverage for that the uh, post hook, uh, post upgrade, sorry, uh, hook uh, that allows us to uh, ensure that whenever we're going to roll Cilium out amongst all of our clusters, these tests are going to be run and therefore have feedback before we uh, roll it out to uh, many clusters and break uh, everything up. So if you do those two things, you are likely to be covering up a very good percentage of the things that uh, can uh, break and uh, at least be aware that uh, things are being broken as you uh, roll Cilium out. But that's in theory, right? In practice, e evolving at this scale, you're always going to have some surprises and that particular cluster, which is an outlier that doesn't behave exactly like the rest of the, uh, uh, of the fleet. So here is an example of such of a situation that occurred to us uh, quite a while ago. So what we decided to do on that day was to change a value of flag on many of our clusters. So this was concerning uh, uh, AWS-based clusters. This was a flag on the Cilium operator. And what this flag does, basically, it instructs the Cilium operator whenever it starts to pull the list of all the available instance types that uh, are present in the uh, particular region that the operator is running at. And for various reasons, we wanted to, um, uh, to disable that feature. Sorry, and yeah, and it does so to be able to know how many ENI it can be, uh, can be uh, associated uh, uh, for a given uh, instance types. And it worked great. We rolled that out. Uh, great, but on one cluster. On that particular cluster, what we discovered is that new pods were not being able to come up properly on any node that didn't have any uh, IP uh, uh, available uh, on their pool. We uh, started to be fed with these uh, logs, like waiting, uh, the Cilium agents were uh, yeah, uh, throwing, waiting for IPs to become available and suggesting us to check what was happening with the Cilium operator. On the Cilium operator side, we couldn't see anything uh, odd uh, from the logs. So this is where starting to leverage the debugging capabilities uh, that are at your disposal can be helpful. So you have various ways to debug what is happening within your Cilium agent and operator pods. 
So you can, for instance, leverage the Cilium bug tool command, which is very efficient and can provide you with a lot of information about what's happening uh, within your uh, Go processes, as well as a lot of uh, Cilium-oriented details that uh, can be very useful as well if you are requesting from help from the Cilium uh, community. Uh, <coughs> Otherwise, what you can do is uh, enable the PPRO flag uh, on the Cilium agent or the operator and leverage the, um, the base uh, Go, uh, Go tool PPRO uh, uh, tooling. So luckily for us at Datadog, uh, we are an observability company and uh, one, facet of, uh, one feature of our product allows us to uh, actually store and restitute some of this data over time. And this can be particularly useful, for example, when you are attempting to uh, assess the performance of a particular uh, piece of the code pass from one version to the other. Um, so yeah, so forgot to mention. So this is called continuous profiling. This comes at a price though. Continuous profiling uh, uh, involves some overhead. And in our case, we decided to not uh, enable it by default on all of our uh, CDOM agents and operators. So in order to overcome this situation, we came up with this idea of having a uh, well, idea or hack, define it uh, as you wish. Uh, but uh, uh, what we did is that we have that uh, a dedicated daemon set that is uh, configured to be um, uh, pinned by a, a node selector. So that way, whenever we want to troubleshoot uh, a particular node, we just have to set that label, and the Cilium agent is going to be restarted with the uh, correct uh, configuration. So back to this example, why did we uh, have this particular uh, issue on that uh, cluster? So the root cause uh, in the end was the fact that uh, on that particular cluster, we had uh, specific instance types that was only present in that cluster. And the current version of the CDM operator we had was not aware uh, about the uh, ENI uh, spec of that uh, instance type and was uh, entering uh, a deadlock situation, not fulfilling any other request and being stuck in that uh, limbo uh, state. If you're interested to learn more about this, there is the, the PR uh, attached to it. And uh, yeah, uh, so I talked to you about how you could easily uh, dig into problems and uh, how you should uh, yeah, not hesitate to uh, uh, investigate. But before you know there is a problem, you need to have sufficient health and uh, observability to figure this out. So now I'll let uh, Emos talk to you uh, about that. Uh, thanks, Maxime. So similar to how we monitor the health of the services we build, it's also very important to monitor the health of Cilium's control plane, data plane, and all the external dependencies Cilium has. And for those of you who run Cilium on the cloud, the most important thing you can monitor is rate limits with your cloud providers. And here's a screenshot from one of our incidents where the Cilium operator was getting aggressively rate limited to an extent that almost 100% of our API calls were being rejected by AWS. So we took a closer look at how many calls we were actually making, and we realized that we were, all, we were actually making around 1,000 API calls per second. But this is not supposed to happen because Cilium operator has a feature called client-side rate limiting, and we have a QPS and a burst value configured. So there's no way we could have made uh, 1,000 API calls per second. So it turns out there was a bug in Cilium operator, which resulted in the client-side rate limiting being completely bypassed, and that resulted in us uh, in Cilium operator making around 1,000 API calls. And the fix for this has been available from uh, 111. And at Datadog, we run Cilium in KV store mode with HCD. It is recommended that you use HCD in clusters that are of large size. And this time, there was another bug, but we were actually upgrading from a version uh, which had the bug to a version where the bug was actually fixed. And sometimes this also can be tricky because this bug was actually impacting the KV store package. And the version we are upgrading to was actually starting to enforce these rate limits. So what this ended up uh, causing is the Cilium operator was unable to garbage collect its Cilium identities. And as a result, it was taking a long time for new pods to get their own Cilium identities. So after this incident, we started to closely monitor all of our interactions with KV store mode so that we can stay on top of what's happening in our clusters. And sometimes monitoring for simple metrics like agents in crash loop back off or operators restarting can also be really helpful. 
And in this example, uh, the, operate, uh, the agent restarting metric allowed us to catch a deadlock in the KV store package where a Cilium agent was trying to write to a channel uh, and after 128 entries, it couldn't write anymore, so it entered a deadlock state. And as soon as it enters a deadlock state, the agents would fail health checks and that would end up restarting the Cilium agent pods. So, data path. So, in our experience, we found that the data path with Cilium has been quite stable for the most part, but we did run into a few issues. And in this section, we'll talk about a couple of examples, and we'll also get into how we can avoid them with the right configuration and monitoring. So this incident started with one of our users reaching out to us saying that uh, they, they were not able to access their cluster IP service. So when you create a Kubernetes service of type cluster IP, Cilium stores the corresponding backends in a eBPF map called backends v2. And there is a, uh, there is a related feature called graceful termination where Cilium monitors for pods that are entering a terminating state and proactively removes them from the backend list so that they don't get any more new traffic. But there was, a, there was a corner case, and if somebody deletes the Kubernetes service while one of the pods is actually in a terminating state, Cilium would leak those backends. And what happened here is, um, so it's actually really expensive to calculate the total number of entries in an eBPF map. So in order to work around that, Cilium maintains an in-memory count of total number of uh, additions and deletions to BPF map. So when we used the Cilium CLI to check how many backend entries were actually present, Cilium told us that there were 3,000 entries. But when we used BPF tool to check the total number of entries in the BPF map, we were actually exhausting the map. So once we reported this, Upstream was really quick in uh, fixing this. And Upstream also included a test to make sure this does not happen again. So that was really a corner case. But after this incident, uh, we did a postmortem and realized that we had no monitoring on our BPF map usage whatsoever. So we were looking for, uh, does Upstream have anything that helps us monitor this? And turns out there was uh, a metric called BPF map pressure, but it wasn't enabled by default in, in the version that we were currently running on. So this BPF map pressure metric is actually quite interesting because it does not actually cover all types of BPU, uh, BPF maps, especially when you are using uh, BPF maps of type LRU, there is a limitation with the Linux kernel. So the limitation is that um, if, if you're trying to add a new entry to the BPF map and the kernel evicts an existing entry to make room uh, for that new entry, there's no way for the user space to know about it. So Cilium cannot maintain an in-memory count of how many entries are there. Until very recently, uh, this is also like a commit that did not land in any of the Cilium versions yet. So if you're using kernels five, six, and above, Cilium started using a batch API to efficiently calculate the total size of the BPF map. And with this, uh, we should also have support for uh, BPF maps like connection tracking. And you would think the community would stop here, right? Because we have everything we need. But no, so Cilium actually started working with the uh, kernel community as well to try and come up with an API or some mechanism to expose that um, information back to the user space. And this is the kind of work that gets us really excited about uh, working in Cilium. This is just one example, but there are several, several examples where the community team has been working with the kernel community to try and introduce features that would benefit container networking. So there's one flag that can help you with right-sizing your BPF maps, and that's called uh, BPF map size dynamic ratio, in which Cilium agent will actually look at the total amount of memory that's available on your node, and it will proportionally size your BPF maps. And there are a few more gotchas that you need to be aware of with BPF maps. Uh, one of them is if, you, if your users create a network policy uh, of type allow all, uh, so you can easily fill up the policy BPF map depending on the total number of identities that are present in your cluster. And if you find yourself in a situation where you have to resize the BPF map, currently there is a limitation uh, or a bug which ends up, which, which results in packet drops due to missed tail call events. And it's currently being addressed upstream, and I think the fix should be backported up to 112. 
So talking about metrics, one another metric we find really, really helpful is this uh, agent's metric called controllers failing. So Cilium agent itself is made up of several independent controllers that are tasked with just one thing. And every time this any of those controllers fail, Cilium bumps this flag. And for a long time, we were not able to find out which controller was failing until recently, uh, as with everything things keep changing very fast in Cilium. So there's a new PR that exposes this information, and in future, you should be able to know exactly which controller is failing. And in order to get a holistic picture of how your BPF-related features are working, there are, there's also a metric called BPF Map Ops Total that allows you to monitor how your, um, how your BPF calls are performing. So if you were to recommend one single tool to add to your toolbox, that would be BPF Trace. And BPF Trace is a high-level tracing language for Linux systems, and it uses CBPF to help you debug different aspects of the kernel. And I'll talk about a couple of examples. Um, so in this... So in this example, uh, one of our users were reporting uh, packet drops. And this was happening because our Cilium identity was getting corrupted. And Cilium identity is made up of two components. So there's a pod local identity and a cluster identity. Both of them together form a global identity, which can be used to enforce network policy when you mesh your clusters together. So at Datadog, our cluster provisioning system randomly assigns a cluster ID. So sometimes the cluster IDs can be big. And what Cilium does is this, cluster, uh, this identity information gets serialized into the kernel's SKB mark and rest gets restored somewhere else in the data path. There's a completely unrelated feature to support node ports in ENA mode, which was also using the same, uh, 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 same SKB mark. So what would happen is sometimes the eighth bit in the SKB mark would be wiped out and that ends up corrupting the Cilium identity. But the most important part here is that we were able to use BPF tool to trace the kernel's SKB mark value and figure out that the value was actually being changed. And there's also another talk we gave in last CiliumCon that also uses BPF tool to do similar kind of debugging. And I would like to summarize this section with another uh, pull request by Laurent here, where it really emphasizes the power of eBPF, where we were actually able to fix one of the kernel bugs by repurposing one of Cilium's uh, eBPF programs. And there's also talk, uh, this talk is also available on YouTube, so check it out if you're interested. Don't think we have time for additional naps. So what did we learn uh, by running Cilium for the last uh, few years? So sometimes when you look at Cilium um, uh, from, a, from a distance, it can look like a black box. But the community has been building a lot of tool, uh, community has been building a lot of tools to make it easier. So don't hesitate to dive deep. And depending on the nature of your applications, sometimes issues can take a while to appear. So make sure you invest in testing and the right kind of observability and invest in things like canary rollouts so that you can catch the issues before they land in production. And we really believe that Cilium is your best bet to leverage eBPF for container networking. And I would like to emphasize that your infrastructure might be unique and the kind of features that you're interested in or the kind of bugs you're running into might not be what the rest of the community is running into. So make sure you engage with the community, let the community know what's working out well for you, what's not working out well for you. Yeah, and thank you. If you're interested in working on weird and fun Issues like this, we're always hiring. You can reach out to either of us. Thanks. Okay, I think while our next speaker just gets mic'd up, we might have time for like one quick question, maybe? I see someone approaching the mic. Awesome. Is that cluster ID greater than 128 bug, is that fixed? Um, yeah, or, good question. Where can we go for more information? Yes, uh, so there's, a, uh, there's an upstream issue that discusses this in a lot more detail. Um, so currently we worked around it by making sure we don't use the node port feature along with cluster ID 128. So currently it's actually not addressed upstream, but um, so in order to work around that, we need to implement a related feature using eBPF. So it's still open, but I can talk to you more about it after this. Yeah, yeah. we have a workaround. Yeah.